United States Navy presents an official report for the armed forces and the American people. Navy screen highlights. Canaveral, Florida, the white glare of publicity spotlights the first United States effort to launch a human into space. Hundreds of reporters from dozens of countries will tell the world of our success or of our failure. Of seven astronauts trained for the human probe into space, one is chosen. He's Alan B. Shepard, Jr., Commander, United States Navy. He's made the flight hundreds of times in ground-anchored training devices, now his training and the training of hundreds of space scientists and technicians is put to the test. The first flight is planned to be suborbital the first of many checks on equipment and procedures before committing a human being to a full orbit of the Earth. Countdown time is hours away as Commander Shepard boards his space capsule. The capsule, jammed full of complex equipment, sits atop its redstone missile like a small cap on a large bottle. Camera inside begins recording as the countdown nears the space age's most exciting word, liftoff. Millions of breaths are held, millions of fingers are crossed, as millions of anxious eyes follow Commander Shepard's flight on television. He has a new phrase to our language when he reports by radio that everything is A-OK, -okay, absolutely perfect. Recorded by the space capsule camera, Commander Shepard, even under conditions of acceleration, weightlessness, and deceleration, is able to perform work, to observe, to maintain communications with the Earth, and to control and change the attitude of the capsule in flight. In time and distance, the flight is brief. 15 minutes to travel 115 miles up and 300 miles down range, reaching a top speed of 4,500 miles per hour. But we went an exploratory tow in the edge of space and learned that the water is fine. It's the first step without which there could be no others. Recovery of the capsule from the waters of the Atlantic is uneventful thanks to the many practice recoveries that preceded the manned flight into space. As calmly as a tourist, Commander Shepard checks his space vehicle for any forgotten items. The world will not soon forget his flight but it's likely to longer remember two other things. The infinite precautionary measures that demonstrate our concern for the individual and our complete lack of secrecy, our willingness to dare public failure. An American space flight enhances the cause of freedom. Aboard the aircraft carrier Antietam in the Gulf of Mexico, a 10 million cubic foot balloon, the largest ever built, strains for release. It will carry two Navy men aloft to gather information about the reaction of men exposed to space-like conditions for an extended period. Their spacesuits, the same as those of the Mercury astronauts. It's the first manned balloon flight to be launched from a carrier at sea, the fifth ascension of the Stratolab High Research Series. Instruments attached to the men's bodies telemeter information back to Earth, heart action, body temperature, respiration and brain waves, recorded for future study. And 
sets a new altitude record for manned balloon flight, nearly 21 and a half miles high. The plan of the day is go east and go fast for three Navy Phantom Jet fighters. Parting Ontario, California, they streak toward New York, refueling three times en route at mid-air tanker stations. The McDonnell F-4Hs are competing in the Bendix Trophy race, out to beat the transcontinental speed record of three hours, seven minutes, and 43 seconds, established in the 1957 event by the Air Force. At the New York Naval Air Station, all eyes are on the finish line. Within 15 minutes, they see the record smashed three times. Three hours, three minutes, two hours, 57 minutes, and crossing the line last, but breaking all the records, team number three, with a breathtaking time of two hours, 47 minutes, 17 and three quarters seconds. Welcome for pilot Lieutenant Dick Gordon and his radar intercept officer, Lieutenant Junior Grade Bobby Young. Their trophy winning speed averages nearly 870 miles per hour and earns them congratulations from Secretary of the Navy Connell. At Windsor Locks, Connecticut, a Navy twin turbine helicopter takes a crack at two speed records within a week. The HSS 2 is a boat hauled night and instrument flight helicopter designed to detect, identify, track, and destroy enemy submarines. Over a three-kilometer straight line course, the big chopper sets an all-time helicopter speed record, a hair less than 193 miles an hour. Seven days later, a new record over the closed circuit 100-kilometer course, nearly 175 miles per hour. Naval aviation riding high during its 50th anniversary year. Her flight deck could hold two of our largest ocean liners. Her control centers are a marvel of electronic data processing equipment. She's armed with Terrier guided missiles. She's the Kitty Hawk, fifth in the fleet's big carrier class. Commissioning ceremonies at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard make her part of the fleet. Admiral Arleigh Burke, Chief of Naval Operations, describes the Kitty Hawk as the forerunner of a new and greatly improved line of carriers. And he added, the role of the attack carrier and her aircraft stretches far into the future. Kitty Hawk, mammoth and mighty addition to our fleet. She's the fourth ship to bear the name Bainbridge, and she's the Navy's first nuclear-powered guided missile frigate. The name was first given to a 12-gun brig which fought in the Civil War, next to the Navy's first destroyer, DD No. 1. The third, another destroyer, served in World War II. Now it's the fourth Bainbridge at her launching and christening at Quincy, Massachusetts. She'll mount twin Terrier missiles fore and aft, and her screws will be turned by twin nuclear reactors. Bainbridge. A proud name takes a bold plunge into our Navy's future. A modern day Pony Express heads for a rendezvous in the South China Sea. Pony Express, the code name given to the largest military exercises to be held by CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. British commandos represent one of the eight participating nations. Their assignment, vertical envelopment of an area in North Borneo. The exercise assumes that a CETO member has been overrun by an aggressor, and CETO forces are rallying to turn back the invasion. It's a practice run, purely defensive in nature, designed to iron out the wrinkles in a collaboration of many forces joined in defense of the common freedom. It's stark realism all the way, a preparation and a rehearsal to keep our muscles trim, 
and at the same time a notice. Sito is not looking for trouble, but if it comes, Sito can handle it. The USS Hazelwood demonstrates her DASH weapon system. DASH, standing for destroyer-based anti-submarine helicopter. It's an unmanned drone sped on its way from a deck control station. Its mission, to carry a sub-hunting torpedo to the outermost limits of sonar range. In flight, control is taken over by the ship's combat information center. The drone helicopter directed to intercept the bogey sub, where it unleashes its homing torpedo. If necessary, the drone is expendable to defensive action or dirty weather, but it may return to fly and fight another day. Dash, a longer arm for ASW. Shooting stars, parachuting that is, watch their free-falling maneuvers. Navy airmen, skydiving daredevils who loop the loop and pass batons from hand to hand while free falling from 10,000 feet. As a climax to their freewheeling mastery of the air, the El Centro team spells N A V Y. A tribute to 50 years of naval aviation. A man in a situation like this could use a lift, and the Navy's all set to give him one. It's a package deal that arrives from the sky. But in this case, what comes down must go up, as our friend is shortly to learn. It's an aerial retriever system called Skyhook, a word associated with much jesting in the past. What? Will our hero fly merrily away in his own private blimp? Well, yes and no. The blimp will fly, but our man needs an assist. Must be he's too heavy an anchor. What would happen if we grabbed the rope with this pickup yoke? Let's give it the old college try. system looks like a Rube Goldberg invention, but it works. The strain on the man at pickup is only a third of that experienced during a parachute jump. Skyhook works equally well on land and can snatch up equipment or supplies as easily as it rescues a person. How's the ride? Well, as our hero says, oh boy. Oh boy. 